this abstract algebra tutorial I will be teaching you about groups. Following on from the lesson on operations, an algebraic structure is a collection of sets and operations on those sets. Abstract algebra exists to study ab algebraic structures which have certain properties like commutativity and associativity. To engage in this study, it's best to start with an algebraic structure that's both simple and which you can find familiar examples of. This is, this is where groups come in. They are simple enough for an introduction and structurally familiar enough to provide examples that aren't too alien. First, consider a single set coupled with a single binary operation. This algebraic structure is called a magma. This is extremely general, too much so for an introduction. Next, we consider magmas with associativity. These structures are called semigroups. For an example, consider the alphabet and the operation of concatenation, which literally joins strings of symbols together. To demonstrate, LO concatenated with GIC would become LOGIC. This is clearly a magma as concatenation takes any two strings of letters and always returns another st string of letters. This next example shows it is clearly associative. You can now be more specific and call the magma a semigroup as it has associativity. Now we consider semigroups with an identity element called monoids. An identity element leaves every other element, including the identity element itself, unchanged under a binary operation. Some immediate examples would be 1 in ordinary multiplication and 0 in ordinary addition. To go back to our previous example though, concatenation on strings doesn't have an identity element as the resultant string always has a different length to the input strings. You could, however, extend the set of strings to include the empty string with literally no symbols in it. Unlike 1 and 0, we can't see the empty string, so the Greek letter lambda is used to stand for it. To demonstrate, DOG concatenated with the empty string produces DOG. This would clearly be an identity element. You can now say that the set of strings and the empty string under the operation of concatenation form a monoid. Finally, we consider monoids with a property known as invertibility. Monoids with invertibility are called groups. Invertibility means that for every element there is another element called as inverse, such that when x operates on inverse x, or when inverse x operates on x, you get the identity element. You would usually see the inverse of x written like this. For the general case, the identity element of a monoid or group is traditionally denoted by the letter E. So A operated on inverse A produces the identity, as does inverse A operated on A. It looks like the previous monoid doesn't have the property of invertibility and so isn't a group. A single counterexample shows this. To demonstrate, you can't concatenate DOG with anything to get back to the empty string. There are plenty of familiar examples of groups though, and that's why we study them. For our first example, the study of positive integers under addition. Addition certainly qualifies as a closed binary operation, so we have a magma. Addition, as shown here geometrically, is also associative, so we have a semi-group. Zero doesn't change the identity of any element under addition, so we have a monoid. Because we have the negative numbers, we have invertibility. A plus negative A always gives us zero, so we have a group. Next, let's consider real numbers under multiplication. Again, it's obviously a magma with associativity, so we have a semi-group. As mentioned earlier, 
1 multiplied by any num real number won't change the real number. So we have a monoid. This, however, is as far as we can go. Invertibility means that for every element there is an inverse element. For 2 it would be 1 half, and for 10 it would be 1 tenth. 0, however, does not have an inverse. This single counterexample means a monoid doesn't have invertibility. It is, however, the only counterexample, so removing the element 0, we would have a group. In this last example of a group, a stranger but perfectly acceptable binary operation is considered. This operation takes two elements and adds their sum to their product. We give it a symbol and define it algebraically in this way. The underlying set, that is the set which it takes A and B from, is the set of real numbers, excluding the number negative 1. To prove that this algebraic structure is a group is not as straightforward as the previous two examples. We begin by establishing closure. The operation would have to produce a single real number. Looking at the definition, it is clear that the operation when given two real numbers won't return more than one real number. For closure though, we have to prove that it can't return negative 1. So we set up an equation where A operated on B does return negative 1 and investigate the solutions. Here we use the definition of the operation. Then we add 1 to both sides and use our knowledge of algebra to factorize the expression. For a plus 1 times b plus 1 to equal 0, 1 or both of the factors must be equal to 0, which implies that 1 or both of a and b must be set as negative 1. This can't happen because negative 1 is not in the underlying set, so this equation has no solution and therefore the operation is closed on the underlying set. Next, we establish associativity. We display the definition here. It needs to be proved that the left side of the equation is equal to the right side. Looking at the left side, we define x operated on y. Then we substitute this back in and define x operated on y, all operated on z. Then we remove the brackets, trying to keep things alphabetical so we can recognize it later. Finally, we rearrange it again for recognition purposes. Now we look at the right and apply the same procedure. We define what's in the brackets first substitute this back in and define x operated on that. Again, we remove the brackets keeping things alphabetical, then we rearrange it as before. As you can see, the left hand side does equal the right, so the operation is associative. Thirdly, we establish the existence of an identity element. The definition is displayed here. It needs to be proved that both of these equations have equal solutions for the general element. Starting with the left, we write the definition of x operated on E and equated with x. Because we are trying to solve for E, we factorize, then subtract x from both sides. Finally, we divide both sides by 1 plus x. We couldn't do this if 1 plus x was equal to 0, but this is impossible, as x can't be negative 1, so the right identity is 0. The exact same reasoning is performed on the right equation. We write the definition of E operated on x, and recognize that this can be rewritten as one of the previous lines. So this semi-group does have an identity, namely 0. Finally, we establish the invertibility property. The definition is displayed here. Similar to before, we need to prove that both these equations have equal solutions for the general element. Starting with the left, we write the definition of x operated on inverse x and equate it with the monoid's inverse element 0. 
because we are trying to solve for inverse x, we factorize, then subtract x from both sides. Finally, we divide both sides by, by 1 plus x, which, by the previous reasoning, is permitted. Again, the same reasoning is performed in the right equation. We write the definition of inverse x operated on x and recognize that this can be rewritten as one of the previous lines. So for the general element we have a well-defined inverse element meaning the monoid has invertibility. Having proved these four properties hold we can say it is a group. Before moving on to part 2 test your understanding of the concepts with these questions. Can a singleton set, that is a set containing only one element, form a group? Does a set of integers that are multiples of 5 form a group under ordinary addition? What type of algebraic structure is a set of rational numbers excluding 0 coupled with ordinary division? Does a set of all three-dimensional vectors having real values for their components form a group under the cross product operation. Next, try understanding and exploring the concepts further. In algebra, abstract algebra it is so often the case that identities are two-sided that they are simply called identities. Identities may in fact be one-sided. Consider the case of two by three matrices. These have distinct right and left identities. If a group has an identity, it is, is it necessarily unique and two-sided? Another question of uniqueness is that of inverse elements. A way to go about determining if this is true is to suppose that an element does have two inverses and prove that they must be equal. So far we have only considered Arbolean groups, that is, groups with commutative operations. Can you think of a group which is not Arbolean? Remember to check that it satisfies four group properties, also known as the four group axioms. Finally, start to think about groups within groups and what this might mean. Thank you for watching and see you in part two.